I definitely want to uh, take a moment to welcome all of our guests um, from what's seeming like uh, all over the world. I do see some of our uh, our students here, and, and you know, first and foremost, I think um, we'd like to put these um, these talks on uh, to to provide a bit of distraction from the. Hey, I'm sitting in, of course, we're sitting in front of the computer here, but, you know, something a little bit different than coursework and, and you know, um, your, your instructors up here lecturing. Um, and for those that, that aren't specifically in our program, I definitely welcome you as well. I think um, this is going to be an interesting talk. Um, and so what I'd like to do is introduce our uh, esteemed guest here. We've got Matt Toner. Um, and I'm just going to cheat a little bit here and, and read off of his uh, LinkedIn here. Um, I find his, his uh, uh, little synopsis about himself to be interesting. So Matt Toner is a serial starter, creative producer, visiting professor, and sometime entrepreneur in residence for early stage investors. Working in New York, Toronto, Vancouver, and Silicon Valley, he has launched half a dozen startups, brought three skunk works to life, spun out two tech companies, worked on dozens of games, and oddly created a nationally televised animated series. Um, so in a, in a very, very brief nutshell, this is our, uh, our, our guest for this evening. Um, I've had the pleasure of, of having a few quick chats with Matt. I didn't want to dig too deep um, until this conversation. Um, because, uh, you know, there's something to be said about discovery, right? <laughs> um, so it's uh, a pretty uh, informal format that we're uh, going with for these talks. Uh, so we're going to start with a few, um, uh, you know, just brief discussions that revolve around uh, problem solving and design thinking. And um, uh, Matt's got some great ideas about bad ideas. Uh, so we're going to talk for about 30 minutes. Uh, and then what we'd like to do is open up the floor uh, to a Q&A session. So please feel free to um, uh, add any questions into the, uh, the Q&A section uh, within Zoom. Uh, we do have a moderator who will be um, bringing up some of those questions for us to, uh, to hopefully get you guys some good answers. Um, but yeah, that's that's sort of the broad lens that we're um, going to be talking about today is 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 really, um, you know, how do we know when something is working? And, you know, if for some reason something isn't working, what can we learn from um, from those those bad ideas or those mistakes, as we call them, right? And I find it really valuable, especially as you're, um, you know, first starting out, you know, we're, we're all just, uh, quite frankly, a little bit frightened to make some bad decisions and, you know, design something that possibly won't work. <clears throat> but I find it important that, you know, um, uh, we, or we don't become, you know, sort of too afraid of making those types of mistakes. Uh, so with that said, hopefully I've set you guys up in terms of uh, the, the subject matter. Um, I would like to hand it over to Matt to um, uh, sort of uh, further introduce himself. And what I'll do is I'll pull up a few slides that Matt has uh, graciously built. Um, and then we'll take it from there. Yeah, How's great. that sound? <laughs> great. That, that sounds good. And maybe the one thing I would say to build on top of uh, your comments there, Chris. It's great to be here. I mean, you know, I was actually a student uh, at the film school seemingly a long time ago. And uh, for me, it is, uh, it, it seems to come back and be kind of part of this process through a different uh, lens or a different filter, right? Which is the filter of, you know, can I offer something back to you folks? Uh, one thing I'd say is that you'll probably find is that uh, you're going to notice in your career early on that you're going to be uh, thrust into bad situations design-wise, more so than have them, you know, created by your own designs, probably. I mean, maybe right now in school, you're going to make some mistakes and create problems for yourself. But typically as an earlier stage creative or working designer, innovator, problem solver, you'll be getting something handed to you by a client or a producer or your boss. And then you've got to make the most of that. 
right? Versus later in life, when you get a little more gray in your beard, like uh, like Chris and I have, it's uh, your own decisions <laughs> that you're gonna have to kind of live with. So that's probably a worthwhile distinction, right? Uh, sorry, there's one thing here, shut that off. So where would you like to start, man? You wanna talk about kind of how I got going with this? And, yeah, know, just sort of, so I pull, I, I've pulled up um, your, your first slide here, and I think it would be helpful for the audience to get a, you know, a super high level overview of, of, of just the trajectory that you've been on. Yeah. Um, well, the, I think the first thing I'd probably point out is that I do think of myself as a working creative. And I mean, a word that gets tossed around a lot nowadays is innovator or innovation, but you know, it, it really comes down to applied problem solving, right? And design is problem solving, right? It's either a business challenge or it's a creative challenge, it's a visual challenge, it's a storytelling challenge but it is a, it's a problem solving challenge. And so I think myself as a working creative. And I think that uh, again, a lot of the stuff I learned along the way, it's, it's interesting. I mean, to answer your question more directly, Chris, I started out before being part of the Vancouver Film School community. So I'd already kind of learned a few things the hard way, uh, working with in companies in Toronto and companies in New York. I started a dot com back in 1999 with uh, three of my friends. Uh, like everybody else back in 1999 pretty well yeah um but when we got going we were building basically what we now call a social network for people with disabilities and you know the first couple of months we were basically three people sitting around a card table in our investor's office and we had one internet cable we'd pass around between us to actually get stuff done six months later we'd raised 10 million dollars and had 80 employees and we're on this kind of crazy launch path so you know i i don't think we actually were, were in a position to be smart and deliberate and resourceful and thoughtful. I think we kind of went with momentum and it carried us where it would, uh, <clears throat> which is an interesting story by itself. And maybe we'll kind of tunnel into that later. But I then ran a design agency in Toronto, uh, which was working on big clients like Starwood and Tiffany's and Cirque du Soleil. So a lot of big brands that were discovering what having a digital identity meant for the first time. And, you know, oftentimes what they felt it was, was based on analog thinking, right? Like stuff that we take for granted today, you know, as a, a way to approach a digital presence or an online presence or an app-based presence was completely undiscovered country back then. Like people yeah. did not know. We had a number of clients that had never done anything profound at all digitally, but were gigantic businesses that were saying, okay, we know this is the future now. Hmm. Let's start heading in that direction. And budgets were big and there's this big momentum of not wanting to be left behind. And that's what led to the, the dot crash, really. It was this kind of crazy consumer sentiment. And then there's like a rebuilding that came after that. So I moved up to Vancouver at that time and took the time to formalize my thinking, you know, by being part of the VBS community in different capacities. And that just really set the arc of my life, my career, really. Like, you know, I've worked in games and I've done TV shows and I've done app-based stuff and I've, I've had some really good experiences and I've, <laughs> I've had some really not so good experiences as well. But yeah. the, the process of design thinking, right? The idea of like even Cooper's early work, you know, years ago, like, you know, thinking about persona and taking those lessons with you. And it's just funny how long it takes for this process to embed itself uh, in people's way of thinking. Like in, we take so much for granted nowadays, but it wasn't that long ago that we were really feeling our way in the dark with like a, a book of matches, right? Yeah. No, so, I, I totally get that. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm reminded of... Uh, things like I can't remember his name right now but the CEO of Ford these days you know has this design thinking or UX uh, design type of background right um, and this is a this is a bit of a new move I think he's been the the CEO for I don't know three three maybe four years or so but you know um, really embracing the idea of not just designing in the bubble um, now, you can certainly get some, some great products, some great uh, experiences that people will use when you design in your own bubble. You know, you might have those, those fantastic ideas that just resonate with the world. But from a business model, um, you know, design thinking and, and it, at least, you know, taking that step to employ some of these processes to to maybe give you, you know, more assurance that your product is going to actually resonate with the audience, right? Um, I find, you know, the the at least the uh, the trend is moving more towards that, mm -hmm. and I, I want to make the differentiation between, you know, 
designing something um, for someone, getting feedback from a from a target audience and things like that, um, and and you know getting the wheels in motion to to not just do what everybody tells you to do, obviously, right? And then I'm reminded of the the Homer car um, example where he you know he just chucks in everything and the kitchen sink to try and please everybody. So where do you find that that line between sort of learning from your either your customers or your your audience? Um, yeah, but but also managing your own uh, genius or, or creative ideas. Well, I mean, the, the first thing I would say, you know, above all is surround yourself with smarter people than you. Right? Like if you're yeah. in a position to do that, do it because that will make your life infinitely easier. No question. Uh, the second thing I would say, and I, I say this with a, a grain of caution, but I noticed it actually had an impact on, on my career. Maybe it's because of my personality or whatever it might be. It was the day we were kind of caught in a design problem, I guess you'd say. And uh, there was pressure from stakeholders and pressure from clients and pressure from the design team, what we could and couldn't do. And we were tangled into a bit of a knot on this. And I said, well, look, we just have to go talk to the... Uh, talk to Boston and say what the truth is. And, you know, and there was like, Oh, you don't understand. Like you can't, it's not how you, you shouldn't do that politically. And I just sort of, I said to myself, look, what's the worst they can do? They can fire me. Okay. Well, that's fine. Like, you know, again, I offer that with a grain of salt. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But yeah, uh, once I kind of made that personal decision that look, it's far better to be straightforward and to be honest and not to wrong foot somebody, but say, look, literally I'm telling you, if we don't do it in a different way, it's going to cause problems. You're going to win more than you lose, like over the long haul, right? Especially when you as the designer are coming in with a body of knowledge that is built up on experience, that is inherited, and you want to, but you want to quantify that by going through the process of user-centric design. You, know, you have to understand that you're bringing a lot to the table that other people can't necessarily plug into, and your design process should be to make it transparent to take all your knowledge and make it available to the other people that are surrounding you, right? right. And that's how you get the buy-in, right? It's not about having the best idea. It's not about having the Steve Jobs genius, like, oh, we're gonna do that this way. Like if we were all that smart, we'd be wearing turtlenecks and a lot richer, right? <laughs> but when you have a good process, it takes you in the right direction. And if you stick to your process, uh, it, it gets you out of trouble. And every time I've ever been part of a team that's been taking a shortcut or I see myself taking a shortcut, it, it always bites me in the ass. I always wind up wishing, gosh, if we'd just done a little more upfront discovery, if we'd had a little more time, if we've insisted on more time to think things through, to test some ideas and to pull them back a bit. And, you know, it, whenever I've done it, it's always paid off. Whenever I've tried to go a little bit quicker, no, it's, it's rarely worked out as well as it could have. Right. And yeah, that, that reminds me of, um, you know, some, some newer um, agencies and, and studios, you know, the buzzwords these days are design thinking, uh, user-centered design, um, human-computer interaction, and, and things like this. And I always, you know, I, I, I love the notion of, because I mean, that's what I kind of live and breathe. But, I, you know, a lot of times I really question, like, sort of how, how, how much do they really embrace um, or, or empathize with, with an audience that they're looking to design for, right? And I, so, yeah. so that's bringing me to um, your latest venture, which is uh, Biba Ventures, right? I find this such a fascinating um, concept and platform um, where, where you're really designing for people that are quite a bit different than you in terms of you know, yeah. uh, you're, you're not a child. Um, of course, you're a parent. So there is that level. And, and oh, hopefully I'm a new parent. Like when you're I, a new parent. When I started out this company, you know, I was doing kind of observational research and whatnot. I found out that a middle-aged dude hanging around the playground, watching kids, taking notes, <laughs> it's not a good look. Like people don't like that <laughs> even a little bit. So, you know, right. it, once I had my own kid, it was a lot easier. Like, like yeah. they, 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 would, they would challenge you. They were they weren't happy, but anyways, yes, I digress. And well, no, it, you know, I find it interesting. I'm just, um, one of the last slides that I sent you actually. So. Yeah. One of the last slides. So, so Biba, right. Um, 
Well, by the way, for the audience at home, Chris and I agreed that we try to make this like we were sitting in a bar actually having a beer and talking. So, you know, thanks for the Zoom problem. version of that, you know, so it's, we'll see if it actually holds up. But uh, it seems like a, it seemed like a good idea and I'm enjoying it at least. So, yeah, yeah, slot you, man. So just for those that, uh, that don't know, what Biba is, it's a smart playground system. So think of it like a Pokemon Go location-based game that is localized to a playground structure and uses the playground structure intuitively as part of the gameplay. Okay, so to Chris's, to Chris, your point, like we found the kids are easy to engage through any screen. We've, we've conditioned kids, it's a full generation now that have never known a screen that is less than magical. Right, that's a profound change in user behavior that's gonna ripple through all the work that's being done as the kids that are now 10, 12 years old have only ever known a touch screen environment like this. It changes everything, I think. Mm -hmm. So kids are easy. You put in like a sound effect, some flashy graphics, you know, a fart noise, they're happy. They'll play the game. They'll brute force their way through it, right? Yeah. We know that most audiences won't do that. So we found the first couple of years where we're trying to find that product market fit, like get that MVP that was actually really working we kept on bumping on the parents because we were digital people. To us, it seemed very intuitive, but when we actually would, would show the application to partners or to parents or to other people who wanted to get involved, like academics and et cetera, they could not figure it out for the life of them. We found that after a while, we had to put in three layers of help and explanation into the experience yep. to ensure that we would get people using it the way that it's supposed to be used. And this was in addition to actual physical signage in the playgrounds themselves as a reinforcement. And you know, we, we, it took us a while, but we figured it out you know, through testing and iteration and sitting down and saying, you know what guys, it's broke, throw it away. Tabula rasa, let's start over. Right. So now we're kind of like saying, can we get to the place where grandparents can use the app? Nannies can use the app, where it's that intuitive and that simple and that easy but again it was one of those things where the industry like the playground industry if i showed you a picture of a playground from 100 years ago and one today you wouldn't see a gigantic amount of difference more difference in your smartphone compared to a phone of even 20 years ago right no question right uh but kids have changed a lot obviously but playground companies themselves and park board operators their way of thinking was pretty rigid like and they often saw playgrounds as like a sanctuary from the digital world even though you know Parents are walking in using smartphones, not watching their kids on Instagram. Kids are conditioned to use smartphones. So the whole audience base was changing, right? So we didn't want to replace physical play, we wanted to augment it. But because the industry had been burned with a few failures uh, and it had a few ideas pitched them that really seemed to sink into their heads, it was really difficult for us to unwind that thinking and get them to just embrace a new idea, right? Well, I noticed like, you know, the first question on your fact page is why am I, why do I want to get my kids in, into this screen? Right. And so I, I found that really refreshing that, you know, those, those harder questions of, and, and, and again, from a student perspective, right. When they're thinking about, okay, what, what do I want my grad project to, to be? If they, if they were to come to us and, and propose, hey, I want to get kids off screens by introducing a screen. You know, we, we would kind of laugh at them, right? Um, and, and so I find it uh, really refreshing how, how you, you, you're definitely sort of taking that head on, right? And you're, you yeah. know, this is, and, and I've, I've done people some testing with Biba. Well, Say people it again. Us, right? like, people did not believe that this was a good idea at all. There was an early broad-based sentiment that this was a terrible idea, right? Mm -hmm. And you name your reasons, right? There's one woman in a small town in New Zealand that's convinced to this day that I'm the Antichrist because I'm bringing technology into a playground. Like, we just could never win her over. But what really helped was in 2017, we did a clinical trial with Simon Fraser University. We said, okay, Let's bring kids into a park, let them play traditionally. We had them on, like, heart rate monitors and things like that, and we cooled them down, give them a snack, and then we had them do our games. And we found that our games would have the kids playing longer, harder, more often, more socially yeah. than the standard playground experience because kids were given a goal and games are goals and they're given mechanics that forced them to use the equipment in a different way. And there was a social dimension because kids would see other kids playing this thing, they'd all start to flock over. Mm -hmm. And then parents would kind of start to flock over to see what's going on, right? So that study and actually doing it that way, like being that, 
uh, confident in our judgment at that time that we'd gotten it right and kind of putting it in the hands of an academic researcher to to prove it, like to validate it or invalidate it. Because I mean, you can't put your thumb on the scale with a clinical peer reviewed kind of study. It just doesn't fly, right? Right. That for us gave us that kind of proof point. But I would not have started there because we had gone through that ver by that time, gosh, like, you know, half a dozen different versions of the experience trying to get that, that, that fit that where we knew that it was going to resonate and click and produce the right outcome. So that is one thing to say, you know, you've got to be prepared to break a few eggs in your thinking. You've got to be prepared to be wrong. And you've got to almost budget the time to discover that. And then have the humility to recognize that's what's happening. Right. Right. And that's tough nowadays because things are, you know, there are things at stake. There's, there's budgets at stake. There's money at stake. How do you convince a client that, Hey, you know what, we got to rethink this, you know, yeah. you convince an investor that, Hey, you know, our idea for, uh, you know, uh, dog food delivered to your door, turns out it, it loses money terribly. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but that goes back to the conviction. And if you, I really believe at least that if you build up that confidence in yourself and you have a process and you can explain it consistently to people, you know, your stock, your credibility as a design professional or as a problem solver, it just goes up and up and up. And, and I should say, you, know, you and I, Chris, talked about this a little bit before the call. The DNA of like a design thinking mindset has changed the arc of my career. There's no question. Because if I hadn't done that, I would just be, you know, a suit, frankly. Like I'm just like some business guy who drives deals and I've got some tech people working for me. Mm. And there's this gulf between us, this huge disconnect. But, uh, you know, having this process lets you have a certain kind of humility and a certain flexibility to your approach. And it helps you in business. It helps you in design. It helps you in storytelling. It helps you in marketing. It helps you in your life. Uh, I see, I think someone's got a hand raised. We're going to do questions like interactively. Uh, I, I believe, so we've got Max, our moderator. Um, I think uh we're gonna we're gonna um just just finish off our conversation yeah, yeah. And, and then we can open it up um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so so that with Biva, i know again like you know it's, it's been we've been enough for a few years mm -hmm. but uh the, the proof of the pudding is is in eating like now that we've got 4500 smart playground sites uh set up in nine countries i think now mm -hmm. and you know millions of minutes played and we're learning more and more all the time about what's really going on in playground spaces. And some of the stuff that we're finding is kind of extraordinary. Actually, it's the conventional wisdom is, is being going to be tested, I think, pretty hard the next year or so by the stuff we're, we're digging out. And that, I think, also, for me at least, is a, is a goal of design thinking, is revolutionary design thinking. It's using it as a tool to come back to people and say, you know, we are going to tip over this apple cart because there's a better way. Like, speaking for myself, when people got back, got into this world of interconnected tech and online media back in the 90s, what drew people in at that time, I mean, you know, some people were drawn for financial reasons, right? But many people, I think, were drawn with the idea that we can change things. Like, the world doesn't have to be this way. We can make it different. We can make things work. Because there's a lot of hidebound conventions that people don't remember. Like, the idea of, like, dressing casually in the office, like, in the early 90s when I was starting my career, that was not a thing at all, right? The not a thing. Or working remotely, not a thing. You know, distance anything, not a thing. And a lot of us kind of approach design thinking with this revolutionary idea, like, you know what? I think this situation can be better. I think we can do this better. I think we can solve this problem. And man, we got problems these days, like societal problems. I think any good designer wants to work on problems and wants to really not just think out of the box, it's a cliche, but apply design thinking and say, you know what? If you give me a long enough lever, I will move the world, right? Mm -hmm. And design is a pretty damn good lever. So, I mean, I hope that all the students that go through the program come out of it with that, that, that sense of revolution or recklessness saying, you know what, I think there's a better way. And I'm going to right. use what I know and my practice, my craft and my, you know, instinct to, to prove that and to make that a reality. Hmm. Because bad ideas may sound off, may start off being quite bad, but they might turn something quite good. It's easy to be dismissive of an idea when it's in its infancy, but if you can push it through, yeah. you know, and that, and it's possible. I, I think digital media is very democratizing. Right. Well said, um, and and yeah, I, I sort of echo that point of um, well, back when I started, um, you know, QA was the the quality assurance was the equivalent of of um, 
design thinking or, or user experience design uh, way back in the in the stone ages right um, so it's it's really really refreshing to see that um, you know more people are, are sort of embracing um, you know pushing forward with their their own uniqueness and their own ideas but also allowing a, a specific audience to to inform um, at least in some part, you know, the direction of, of the experiences that, that we're all building. Um, exactly. And I think you're, you're, a, you're a, um, a, a great representation of, of, a, of a company that, that's doing that. Well, you know, my first venture was with people with disabilities. Right, exactly. Yeah. Like, this is a community that needs a voice. Yeah. Because you know, again, if you want to talk about design thinking, accessible design, I think, is, is really good design. Like a door handle versus a door knob. That is a disability feature, but it's better for everybody, right? Like a curb cut is important for people in wheelchairs, but it's also useful for people that have anything that needs to be kind of taken up and down, right? Like, you know, strollers and, you know, packages and things like that. So yeah. the, what we found that was really interesting, like we were starting this in the early days of the net and we got hit uh, kind of like, you know, pie in the face pretty quick by people from disability organizations saying to us, well, it's great you're building this website, this community, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, my, my, my people are people with visual impairments. How are they going to use it? Is it compatible with, you know, W3C guidelines? You know, mm -hmm. I represent people that have developmental disabilities. You know, I represent people that have, you know, some physical mobility disabilities. Like how can they, they can't use a mouse well. Like what are you going to do to help us? And that kind of caught us a little flat footed because we had to rethink a lot of things fast because we were pre-launch. So we had to get it right by launch. We set a launch date of December 3rd, which was the International Day of Disability. Right? So we're like, okay, we're doing this thing in Washington at the United Nations. We had Walter Cronkite like doing our launch conference. Wow. Staff, right? So for him, he had a connection to disability. Uh, Vince Cerf, who helped invent the internet, really, back in the day, had a connection to disability. So we had a big, like, we got to get this right. But at the time, these disability groups were tackling the U.S. government, saying none of your websites are accessible to us and we need to have access to it. Uh, they were suing AOL, if you remember AOL. Mm -hmm. They wanted to make a point that AOL was not compatible. And, you know, the internet at that time was really, we saw it as the ultimate prosthetic, the best way to bring these people together, give them a sense of shared community and purpose. So we, we really had to make a big investment and, you know, create a champion on our team who is the expert on guidelines. Right. Educate our developers, rethink our design process. Like everything we thought we knew, we had to put aside, like doing like, you know, video online. Well, don't use flash, <laughs> you know, like bad idea. So right. for us, I mean, it was a challenge. We could have sort of plowed ahead and said, well, you know, the people that are blind, mm, we'll get to you later. But, you know, for us, it was important yeah. that we really lived it, you know, and we couldn't be perfect on day one. Perfect, I think, is the enemy of good, right? Mm but it forced our design group to think and rethink and challenge each other on this stuff. And I remember a few very heated design meetings about certain features that people fell in love with. But when we did the, when we exposed people from our intended audience and community to them, we said, look, there's still problems with this folks. We have to, we have to keep working on it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, you know, I think that for anybody who's, who, who really wants to dig into, uh, you know, design thinking as a, as a process or a profession or, or even user experience design, um, you know, who better than someone that is completely different than you are. And, and, you know, in, in terms of accessibility, right. Yeah. I mean, but you'd be surprised the solutions you can find if you just commit to it. I mean, we yeah. found uh, a mouse, a computer mouse, by a company called Logitech. I think they're still around. Yep. They designed it as a force feedback mouse for gamers. Mm -hmm. So you're playing flight simulator, it would give you rumble and stuff if there's an explosion. Mm -hmm. So we found a way to work with it so that it could actually feel the topography of a web page. So it would pull you to the call to action buttons. It would yeah. vibrate when you went over a link. You could give it behavior, right? And yeah. man, I miss that mouse. I used one myself all the time just to, you know, just to commit to it. Yeah. It was a better experience. Like, well, uh, I guess it's kind of weird to explain it that way, but being able to feel a web page, I mean, you can turn the gain up and down so it's really rigid or it's very subtle. Yeah. It was just better, like just, just frankly better. But that was taking a product that people had not imagined could be used in this other way and mm -hmm. saying, I bet we can make this work, right? Right. 
And then when you do, everyone's like, Phew. like we, we demoed that to, if I recall, I wasn't there, but we demoed that to Al Gore at a White House event. It was getting mm -hmm. an election campaign, you know, underway, right? And people just mind blown that you could take this thing that was not designed for that purpose and make it work so well for this other audience, right? Because, you know, visual impairments and visual disabilities, it's an ongoing thing. People get older, it's an ongoing problem. You may not feel you're disabled, but you're getting older, so you need to get online and, you know, anything that'll help will help, right? So yeah. you can get those wins, right? Those yeah. real moments where someone's inside, and it wasn't me, it was someone on my team that said, I think this could do something. And then everyone's like, it just transports your design thinking. Like, oh my God, what else could we do with this? Yeah. Yeah, it takes a certain level of fear, fear, fearlessness um, and just sort of innovative thinking, right? You know, like, I, and again, I'm bringing it back to the students here. Um, it's, it's obviously a, a, a normal reaction to want to, uh, you know, sort of recreate best practices or whatnot that, that you've seen before. But this, this, you know, opportunity for real innovation, I think, is, is where um, you're, you're quite frankly leading the way here in terms of um, not just a tool to help um, kids, families, uh, you know, grandparents, like you say, um, be more active. Um, and, and, you know, let's say for that grandparent to really relate to that, that child on their level, right, and be involved in the new deal. Um, I find that um, uh, you guys have just done a bang up job in terms of what I've seen. Now, of course, we haven't had the opportunity to go out and try it in a playground quite yet. But, but that also brings me to, uh, to a, a point that I wanted to, uh, to share with the audience in terms of, you know, how you must have been freaking out, you know, this, this whole six or seven weeks so far because your, your platform is based on this, this real time, um, you know, public sort of environment. So I wonder if you could just um, uh, talk quickly about, you know, the decision-making process uh, in terms of, okay, what's our next step uh, now that we're faced with this? Well, the good news is this, like obviously playgrounds right now, if you're walking around Vancouver or any city, they're taped up, they're shut down, right? Because of the COVID pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. And, um, one thing that gave us a lot of heart was we looked at a study that came up pretty quickly asking what experiences were people most looking forward to post pandemic? Like what, what do they want to do? And like movie theaters, people are not in a big rush to back movie theaters, museums, community swimming pools, you know, no, everyone's very cagey about that kind of stuff. Sure. But we saw the parks and playgrounds were top of the list. Like people can't wait to get back outside in their communities with their families and in the sun and, and have that kind of experience after being cooped up in apartments that are, you know, Vancouver small or New York tiny, like, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a hunger for this. So we took some uh, refreshment from that, like some encouragement, but also what we did, and this is again, I guess a good example of like problem solving was we quickly kind of huddled up with our team uh, through Slack. And we launched a new feature in about three days that basically took our model and inverted it. So instead of reporting to cities and communities, around the world, how much activity, how much fun people are having, what equipment they're using, et cetera, et cetera. We launched a compliance service. So cities could sign up and we could tell them how to get play to zero, how to make sure the playgrounds were really closed. And if people were showing up, like periodically, we would tell them, hey, there's people that are going there Friday afternoon at three o'clock, you might want to post another sign or send a park board officer over there to explain to them the park's closed. Like, let's get you folks down to zero. Let's help you. Like mm -hmm. we're inverting our product in a sense. And it took us, didn't make us long, three days, four days to get the service together. And it's probably one of our most popular features with city officials because they had a problem that had come out of nowhere. Yeah. We were able to give them a solution right away that actually helped them not just solve the problem, but to be seen to be solving the problem. They had a compliance measure in place that reinforced what they were doing already with, with tape and signs. So, you know, if there's opportunity in, in a down market and an up market. If you're nimble and thinking on your feet, how do we solve this? Like the computer mouse that became the disability device, you know, yeah. same way. I mean, it doesn't always work out that way. You can't always do that, but you, your odds are better. If, you, if, you're, if you're in love with your product and you understand the market, you understand the audience you're trying to reach and you're able to think like, what would I do? Like we thought, what, what are people worried about? We weren't worried about parents so much, you know, although we've got another thing we're launching for parents that are at home, like 
pandemic parenting play, basically, which we hope will be a success. But we thought about the parkour operators and we could solve that problem pretty fast. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, it's this this fearlessness almost to, uh, you know, uh, take that challenge right, right, you know, head on. And, uh, and you know, I, I think a lot of times, and especially if it's your livelihood, right, you know, you'd, you'd you'd get a little bit freaked out and, and some, some people would, would get this sort of paralysis of like, Oh my goodness, I've, I've, you know, built this playground environment. Uh, it's all just broken now, but no, it, it's very refreshing. Okay, now I'm to hyperventilate. Now you give me the nightmares. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So time is just flying by here. I can't believe it's already quarter to six. Nope. Um, I do see some questions in the, uh, the Q and a box. So if you don't mind, maybe I'll, uh, I'll toss a few of those your way. Please. please. Okay. So, uh, Oh, this should be an interesting one because I did hear, uh, or I read a, a little detail here, but so Alex Gilbert says, have you considered go inside school playgrounds? If yeah. not, why not? Uh, quick answers, definitely have. But the, the trick there is there's different uh, curriculum in different states and provinces and districts. So matching, like having a really like dialed in application for schools would be very difficult to do because the standards vary so widely from not just country to country, but even like province to province or state to state. Mm -hmm. So we had to think about that hard. Like, okay, schools, playgrounds, obvious, but how do we approach that? And we talked to a lot of, again, school operators and you know, kind of put our head down. And what we found was that the budgets for physical education in schools, in the United States particularly, are being cut. Like gym classes being cut. So we began developing a series of apps for uh, effectively, I guess you'd say, the, um, the teacher's assistants or the teachers to use at lunchtime or recess with kids. So that basically they can get 10 or 15 kids, maybe the kids that haven't got a lot of friends, et cetera, et cetera, and ha have this really cool game with them that's tablet-based and can the interface is designed to accommodate large numbers of kids. And we base these on standard game mechanics from playground games that we would all know, you know, cops and robbers and hide-and-go-seek and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So we, we did come up with a product that we think is it's a good one, right? Uh, it's not widely deployed yet, but, you know, we knew we had to have something. What we're looking to do now is actually build in some educational help because uh, our games work physically but also with some mini games on the screen and there's some good research out there about how simple uh, smart screen games can actually help teachers learn more about the literacy or the numeracy of the kids involved because they're always trying to figure out is this child doing well at spelling is there something missing right yeah. and we can actually gamify that we can actually lean into that to say you know, actually, of the 15 kids that played this game, this child is always a little bit slower on the mini games that are mathematically based. Maybe he or she needs a little more help, right? Hard to get that in a class of 30 kids. But if you gamify it, it floats to the top, and you can say, maybe I need to have a little extra help with this child. And also, it just helps them socialize the kids better at recess. I mean, we all remember, maybe we were one, or you remember the kid at recess that's always sitting by herself. Like, here's a way that our games can engage that, you know, that student with the teacher's assistant, Instead of being the lonely kid in the playground, they're playing the coolest game in the playground, right? I, I love that inversion of, you know, of, of relationship dynamics, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I totally agree. I think, you know, there's <clears throat> maybe some, some uh, you know, uh, I guess needed uh, hysteria or, or pushback. You know, I, a lot of my friends, you know, they're very anti-screen, you know, very limited screen time for their children. And I'm not, I'm not you know, whatever works for you guys. But um, I, I, I love this, you know, how can we find ways to actually use technology as it was meant for, right? And that's to, yeah. to either give us superpowers to help us learn better, quicker, <laughs> retain information, maybe make us more active. So it's very generationally based. There was a study done that showed that the biggest pushback was, uh, well, boomers were the biggest pushback against technology in public spaces. Uh, you know, Gen X parents, more accepting. Millennial parents, much more accepting. So, you know, it, it is a taste-based thing. Uh, and, and I think the fact is, like, you know, if you're raising a child nowadays, you can see the bad of the screen really easily, right? But, you know, if you can show a good, if you can have healthy screen time, right, 
with your child, like video conferencing with grandma and grandpa. No one would say that is not healthy, right? <laughs> Especially nowadays, right? That's, yeah. you know, that's the thing. So it's, it's just saying to people sometimes that have a bias, like let's explore your bias around this problem and let's understand why you feel this way. And again, as a designer for us, we had to spend some time doing that yeah. and then recontextualize how we were solving the problem. Like one thing we found that made a big difference was we said, look, our experience, the way we've designed it based on this feedback is it's 20% screen engagement. It's 80% activity based. It is. Yeah. The device is held by the parent at all times. The kids never are in control of the experience that way. It's the parent as referee or scorekeeper or dungeon master or whatever. And once we were able to shape our experience around that kind of feedback, like accent those, those attributes, we're hoping to get it to 90, 10, but yeah. if we're honest, it's 80, 20, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that shows that a, your thinking is responsive and your uh, skeptics have to kind of pause and rethink things a little bit. Uh, but also it makes for a better product. I mean, it just, it takes you to a better place, right? I couldn't imagine, I mean, if I look back on our early products from like 2015, I'm like, Ugh, like that's not something I'm especially proud of. Proud of the process though. Yeah, yeah. Always learning, always learning. All right, great. Hopefully that answered your question, Alex. Um, next question is from Fabio. Uh, hi, Matt. Thank you very much for your time. My question for you, where do you draw the line between so-called art and design? Ugh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all, all your participants have cool names, by the way. Fabio, it's a cool name. Um, that comes up a lot. Like mm -hmm. when we uh, first were starting to teach game design at the film school, right? One of the first places in North America to teach the design of games as opposed to the technical part of games. Mm -hmm. That was the real debate. Where's art? Is a game art or is a game design? And nowadays you can say you can have both, right? You can have games that are purely art form and some that are purely design driven. Uh, I, I think the difference here is like art is for you, right? Art is something you do for you and it reflects some aspect of humanity back to the audience. And if it's done well, it forces them to reimagine their experience, their shared experience as a community or as an individual through the filter of what you've created right? Art. Design-driven products really have to have that end user in mind. And by end user, I don't mean the client. I don't mean the guys writing the checks, right? You can work that way if you want to. People do. But if you're really making an experience that's going to be great, it's about getting to the persons at the end of the day going to say, I love this. And especially nowadays, they're going to share it and socialize it and, you know, make it popular. This is the challenge we had. Uh, we didn't really talk about this. Uh, thank God it will give you nightmares. But I worked on two N-Gage games uh, back in the day. N-Gage, for those of you that don't remember, it's this crazy taco game phone device that was launched in like 2004, 2005, uh, which was really just a Series 60 phone in a fancy case. There we go. Nightmares begin. Oh. Okay. And that, that screen, by the way, for those designers at home is 176 by 208 pixels. So all of your <laughs> interface, like we could have a long conversation about interface design for this particular device. Yeah. But we hadn't, no one, no one had really done at that stage. No one had said, who is going to buy this device? What are the considerations of a game being played on this sort of device? And for Nokia, how do you take that to their newer devices that are more purely phones, right? Not a game phone, but a phone phone. They want to bring games, you know, they're really kind of ahead of the curve in some ways. But, you know, we had to do research on like, listen, you know what? Most people that buy blinged up phones nowadays, they're young women, right? They're not they're not gamers. Like if we even did like a simple survey, like how many gamers, what kind of phones do we even have back then? They're all beater phones, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to start thinking about if you're making a game for the kind of person that's going to own a certain kind of device. In our case, we're saying, do we need headshots, splatter, gore, or do you need games that are more like puzzle based, casual games, bejeweled, Sudoku, those kinds of experiences, you know? And you know, that, that was really what people wanted and, and history proved that out like emphatically, right? Uh, but many producers and many publishers came to this device and other devices back then and said, look, I think a PlayStation game could fit in there. So cram in a <laughs> PlayStation game. I want Medal of Honor on that. Yeah. And, you know, it's just, it, it doesn't work, right? The audience, the end user, the person you're designing for doesn't want that through this device or any other device. So, you know, to Fabio's question, I think, you need, as a working creative, to leave room in your life for you. And for those projects that are going to inspire you, and you're an audience of one, 
Maybe someone else loves it. Maybe you share it with somebody. Maybe it goes someplace. Like, you know, at one point I wrote a, a play, a uh, theater, and it was remounted uh, in 2018 in a small town in Northern Italy, right? When I wrote it, it was kind of for me. It wasn't for anything else. It had been produced in Toronto, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact that it then later had a life of its own in another country in another language is just like, you know, still kind of wild to me, frankly. But I make my living by problem solving. And that's where the design comes in. And I think both pursuits are noble. Uh, just don't get them mixed up. Your clients don't want your art. You know? Right. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, you know, it's it's super important to to. I, I find you know if you if you're too rigid in I'm a designer, I'm a problem solver, and you don't allow yourself a you know that that time to to sort of just creatively let go yeah. and and do yeah. things for yourself, right? Because you you must see this in your own work, like working with students. Like you you've got to have that outlet. Yeah. To enrich your work. Like if you're just saying, well, you know, I do things this way. Like I'm sure we could have a great conversation about the stuff you do, you know, that, that scratches that itch. Because I've never met anybody involved in this passion in this profession that doesn't have something on the side, right? Something that they're working on that they do it for the love of doing it, right? Maybe maybe we'll save that conversation for next week. <laughs> sure. <Perfect. laughs> All right. Great. Hopefully that answered your question, Fabio. Um, next question and oh yeah, there's a couple, couple, couple more questions. Hopefully everybody has time. Um, we're, we're pretty good on time here. So a question about iteration from Joseph Dakin or Dakin. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, a question about iteration and how to know when something is, isn't working. Uh, do you try and set success slash failure limits before setting out on a project or do you trust your gut to know when to change direction? Mm. You know, I've been doing this for a while and I would say my gut is my least <laughs> trustworthy compass. You, <laughs> um, you know, I'll, I'll, like if you have one good data point, you're way safer than if you're just kind of flying blind. Uh, of course, having said that, you can't iterate your error, your residual down to zero, right? You're never going to iterate your way to perfection, right? There's going to be some gaps and you have to confront those gaps and figure out where you're comfortable with those gaps lying because, you know, otherwise you'll just, you'll stay stuck in beta forever, right? It's, it's a bit of a gut call. It's a, that's where the experience comes in is when you realize, you know what? Perfect is the enemy of good. And we'll learn way more, by the way. You'll learn way more. We're all going to learn way more when you're, experience or your product or your creation is in the hands or the mind of the end user right and, and that which will lead to a fresh cycle of iteration like products are live nowadays they're they're not shrink wrap they're they're living organisms you know so it can cruise for a while you might be quite happy with your metrics but you know we're always looking at our stuff saying you know isn't it time that we fix this thing that we've always been bugged by isn't it time that we really you know look at, at how this menu structure is working and just rethink it. I mean, I'm always, I'm always on to my guy saying, you know, hey, this game for our Smart Playground product, can we cut half the clicks? Like, let's just challenge ourselves. Can we cut half the clicks, Sure. right? Uh, not that you can necessarily do that, but, you know, it's to confront yourself and say, you know, have we gotten a little flabby with this? Mm -hmm. Have we kind of gotten a little lazy? Is there a quicker through line that we can go through? Do we trust our users enough that they're going to be able to make that leap, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, this is no clean answer for that one. No, it's a little bit different than if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? Mm. It's, it's always you know, broke. It's yeah. always broke. Always if broke. You look, if you look at anything and say, "Oh no, we're good," it's like, "Oh no, you're not you're not looking at it correct," right? There's there's not a thing, and I have to tell sometimes some new people on my team that have been with us for only a couple of years, I'm like, "Look, there's not a thing we've done as a company that I'm happy with," right? I'm not dissatisfied with it, but do, do I think we've hit the end of the journey? No, like none of these things. There's always something that you can look at and go, you know what? I bet you we can get a little more out of this. I bet there's something else we can, you know, pull in. I bet the conditions have changed so much. We can, there's something else that can happen here, right? Maybe it's technical, maybe it's art, maybe it's adding a character or taking a character away from a game, you know, maybe it's just moving into another language. We had a call today with people literally on the other side of the world saying, look, how do we localize the experience of Biba to really fit 
your market where cultural norms are quite different. It's not just language. It's like depictions of people and, you know, gameplay modes and what are really meaningful challenges or storytelling elements, right? You know, we, we could just translate and say we're, we're good, right? Hmm. But you can drill deeper too. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I don't think we have time to get into it now, but uh, I just wanted to, you know, I'm reminded of Biba specifically is, is is such an interesting line of, hey, let's let's reinforce physical activity, let's reinforce socialization, but you also sneak in these little learning elements, right? And so this edutainment, I, for the lack of a better word, um, you know, tricking kids almost via um, fun and, and, you know, interacting with their families and things like that. But you do manage to, uh, to really include some, some uh, relevant learning outcomes, you know, whether it's dinosaur bones or, you know, right. things like that. So very cool. Well, I mean, the thing is like you and I, Chris, we could decide we're going to get in shape by meeting every morning at seven o'clock and doing calisthenics, right? And a lot of kids fitness apps, that's kind of the approach they take. Sure. But if you and I just decide we're going to like, you know, once a week play basketball for an hour, then get a beer, we'll show up every week. We will play that game. We're going to get <laughs> way more out of it. And we'll have a beer afterwards. And that just makes a virtuous cycle. Right. And that's how we approach it. How do you make it a virtuous cycle? Not a, not a chore. Yeah. Right. And you know, like, it's not so much the kids again, the kids are the easy ones. Yeah. It's the parents that are coming home after a day at work. They're tired. Like, okay, now I know I got to spend time with my kids, but I'm flat. Like it gives them a prompt. Like, mm -hmm. hey, let's go to the playground. Let's play that pirate game that you love. Great, right? So really, it's, it's the kids, but it's not just the kids. It's the parents, too. Awesome. Okay, a uh, couple more questions here. Uh, so from Jonathan Brioski. Brioshi. Uh, I'm not attending VFS till August. Ooh, we've got a... We've got a, a future student here. So um, his question is, what are good practices to get better as a newer designer? Great question. Great question. Hmm. I think you have to have a voracious curiosity, right? Thank you. Voracious Thank curiosity. You. And you know what, like a designer friend of mine, actually, this will sound funny, but she mentioned recently that that um, Dale Carnegie book, the, uh, what's it called, the famous sales book, Mm -hmm. uh, how to make friends and influence people. Around oh. world. It's like a book from the sixties. It's from way back. And she's rereading it going, Holy shit, this has so much like truth in it. You don't need to go to the latest Ted talk or trend, but reading about things that don't point directly at design, mm -hmm. but influence design. Like there's design choices in so many things. Like I love the, the stories about how they design luggage, like the choices are like, why do we all have the same kind of luggage nowadays? Well, there's a story behind that. Right. Like, how do you design, like, even terminals and airports? What are the choices that are being made there? Uh, even in, in gameplay, I'm sure you play games. If you look at the study of level design, grab a few old books on when we were discovering how to design levels in games, like Doom and first-person shooters and Quake. Like, go back to that stuff. It's, it's like the, the cues, the, the environmental storytelling, you know. These things are being rediscovered nowadays for VR installations. We're going back 25 years and saying, holy shit, when they were making Doom, they, they thought about this stuff, right? And you can learn stuff. You don't have to be the latest or greatest. In fact, you will have more interesting chops as a designer if you can reference cultural anthropology, not just to be a smart ass. No one likes a smart ass, but just to say, look, I've, I've, I can bring something to the table. Understanding typography. Like I'm just fascinated by typography. I mean, my designers hate me. So I'll look at something and design and go, I think your kerning's wrong. And they'll look, what, what? And I'm like, yeah, just take a look right now. And, but, you know, there's, there's so many things you can learn, right? And design is such a wonderful career because you get to learn these things. If you do design like an agency, and, and I'm sure because you have this experience, if you're working on Jenny Craig or you're working on Cirque du Soleil or you're working on Tiffany's or you're working on the Golden State Warriors, you've got to become an expert in that world for a time, right? Mm -hmm. And it's such a wonderful thing to say, like, look, I'm going to really, I want to really figure out Jenny Craig. I want to, who... Who is a Jenny Craig client? Who's trying to lose weight? Why are they coming here? What are they offering? Like just, you know, as a young designer, that may not be something in your life that you're, you're challenged with, but there's a whole category of people that they're looking for help there. Yeah. Like, you know, you can just, you just learn so much. So being curious. Totally agree that curiosity is, is number one. <clears throat> and I always sort of joke uh, at, at least at one point in the year um, uh, with my students is that, 
don't hang out with designers. <laughs> and, and really what I mean by that is be open and, and sort of influenced by everything around you and, and sort of literature. Um, good, good art colors. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, you do sort of, te- if, if you're just hanging out with your design buddies all the time, you get that sort of tunnel vision oh, and, you, and oh. you, you miss out on a lot. Go, go to a country western bar. Like go down to the valley, right? Like those people are people you're also going to be trying to reach at some point, right? And, you know, I'm not saying, God, they're so different than us, but, you know, there, there are different motivational triggers for people. And sometimes, you know, it's a very simple thing you, that you've forgotten, right? And then you go talk to them, like, oh, yeah, obviously. So obvious when I just am reminded of it by somebody that is not approaching as a designer, they're approaching as a user. And for them, what they really care about is just this one simple thing. Nice. Okay, hopefully that answered your question in a, in a roundabout way there, Jonathan. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in August for sure. Uh, okay, so we've got just one or two last questions here and then I think we can wrap it up for this week. Like I said, this time has just shot by. Um, but our, our, one of our final questions from Rishi Gupta is, hey Matt, thank you for sharing your experience. My questions are, number one, was it the idea of this augmented reality based on screen games that made you start your own company or did you always want to work independently? And then a follow up is when did you decide or get the feeling that you would want to start something independent and I guess quit your, your day job? Well, my first startup was uh, 99. So this is sort of my latest uh, venture, right? But I think to answer your question, I mean, timeline aside, uh, at some point for me, whenever this has come around, it's come around as like a, a chance to prove something to myself. Like, I think I've either got a good idea or I've got a good team or there's a good opportunity or there's something that I'm just curious about. Like right now, I've been working for the past few months as like a side project on a virtual reality reconstruction of the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. Not because I need to do this, but because it it's a curious and interesting challenge that I'll, I'll learn something from and that may take things in a different direction. Like, you know, nothing, very little is scripted in life. Uh, if you want to do your own thing, there's never been a better time to do it. Never been a better time to do your own thing in this space. Uh, the cost of entry for a new idea digitally is, I mean, compared to back when I started, like, you know, you do need a CRM. They're out there. They're, they're basically free by comparison. You don't need to build one, right? We had to yeah. build CRM back then. You had to build all these things. You've got, cloud storage, you've got cloud processing, like all these things, like it, you're, the limitations have really come off, right? And you can build more with less. Like it doesn't take the kind of capital it used to take. So, you know, it, it's a gut check for everybody. If you're making good money in a place that you like with projects that are interesting. I always say to all students is don't just be the startup guy or girl, right? Work for a big company, learn a little bit, then do your own thing for a little bit, learn something else, then go back to a big company with that experience. And if you can go back and forth over the time, over like the 10 years of after you graduate, you'll learn way, way more. And you'll be much more valuable to anybody who wants to work with you, whether it's an investor that wants to back your idea or an employer that wants to bring you in. Uh, so explore, like I would say that, you know, the first 10 years of your career, you can make a lot of mistakes. You can try different things, very few consequences, just pick good places to learn. And then when you kind of round the corner into like your mid thirties, you can start to say, look, I know me. I know what I'm good at. And I've got the background and experience to really make a contribution no matter where I go. So yeah, and then you'll make that jump, right? Don't just make a jump because some guy and like, you know, your rich uncle wants to give you a hundred grand to build something. Worst idea ever, whatever your idea is, okay? Uh, but you'll know when, you, when you're ready to make that move. You'll look around and say, look, all the conditions are right. Look, I worked at like a day job for a year one time, was paying me super well, and I was saving a ton of money, but it wasn't really moving me. And then this other idea came along. I was like, God, it's such a good idea. And I'd saved about a year's worth of like runway, personal runway. So I said, look, I can work in this for a year. Maybe I should. Nice. Yeah, my perspective too is a little bit, um, you know, especially fresh out of school. Uh, we do get a lot of students who, hey, I just want to start up my own thing and do that. And I, I mean, there's plenty of time for that. Oh, yeah. I, th- I think it's it's way more compelling to 
to get into a, you know, it could be a, even a small studio, a startup or, or a medium sized studio, but you know, the connections that you make and the, and oh, yeah. you know, e even this conversation that we're having here, right. You, you, you kind of lose out a little bit um, if you jump right in. Now you, that's not to say that you shouldn't, but. No, I agree with you completely, Chris. You need peers. Yeah. Like you don't know what you don't know. Like one of the best creative directors I've ever worked with. I'll give him a shout out here. It was Dennis, who's at Pay by Phone now, like by far in my career, the best guy, the smartest, most energetic, committed design director, creative director. And I met him in a, in a gig where we we're both working for the man kind of thing. Like our desks faced each other across the cubicle. It's like office space, you know? Yeah. So you, you'd be surprised who you meet on the journey, right? So don't rule out the big places just because you want to be a, a rebel. Like, you know what? There are people in there that are aching for a chance to work on something cool. Awesome. Okay, hopefully that uh, helped you out there, Rishi. And our final question is from Lee Hae Jun. Um, bit of a, a, a slightly different direction here, although not not too different because you do um, uh, uh, dabble in in the AR. But do you think AR prevails VR? Yeah, no question. AR is here. Barriers to entry are low. Consumer acceptance is high. Right. Uh, VR big splash, a lot of money, but you know, low adoption, complicated, uh, a lot of design problems we haven't solved yet. Uh, so augmented reality, it makes sense for people. Like people right now are really talking about how augmented reality apps might save retail, right? The idea that, you know, if you can enhance that retail experience, people are coming back in and they've got a different dimension of information while they're walking through a, well, not a J crew, but you know, through other stores, uh, big, big possibility. Like the stuff Ikea was doing, like, you know, imagine your home, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's a loan of barrier to entry. People can do it, but you know, look, I gotta tell you, it's like, uh, we were doing something years ago with Google glass. Remember that? And the daily show, John Stewart show came out with a spoof of it. Like just showing how ridiculous the whole concept was, but it really wasn't, but they kind of made fun of it in a very interesting way. It was the day we were going in front of some investors said, Oh, we're fucked. John Stewart's making fun of us. We're fucked. Right. Part of my language. I guess that's the problem. Uh, but the thing is like the, the, the headsets and things like that, it's just people are, it's a barrier for people, right? Mm -hmm. It looks kind of weird, it looks kind of scary, you know? Locomotion is still a problem. Like I think there's amazing things you can do with it. That's why I'm working with it. But yeah, AR today, VR in three years. Yeah. So that, that's how I would approach it. I, I, I again, I, I agree. Um, you know, the headset, like it's almost like an industrial design challenge on top of everything yeah. else. Well, it's uh, like Google Glass should have been designed by some design firm in the fashion industry. It yeah. looks just like so amazingly like it's like a supermodel would wear kind of thing, right? Yeah. Then they made it look like tech. It looked like you were wearing an engineer's thing on your face, right? And yeah, yeah. And even even the 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 VR stuff too. I think you know they're making progress with the the sort of halo type where you can just yeah. quickly lift it up and down. But even though it's just microseconds of of okay, I'm going to do VR now. So I got to get all the wires and, you know, yeah. not quite, not quite there yet. Right. Yeah. Well, but give it a couple of years. There's good industrial applications yeah. for it, by the way, like that, that'll come along more quickly, but the idea that we're all going to be in our homes, jacked into the multiverse. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that's where VFS, um, you know, there, well, there is a, a dedicated VR, AR design um, and development program, and, and their focus really is on industrial applications, oh, yeah. right? Training, less those, entertainment, more, you know, utility. Yeah, those lessons we're learning now on kind of the, the stuff that's maybe a little less sexy or something, if you want to call it that, yeah. they're going to be transposed so easily to the other stuff. Yeah. Like, it, 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 it is a good bet to learn those things now and to understand the limitations. And then when the technology opens up a bit more, people will be ready to take advantage. Like I think now is a great time to be learning that stuff, you know, because mm -hmm. again, life is long. You know, if you're a student coming in right now or you're first early in your career, VR is a good bet. Like it's, it's a really good long bet. Nice. Flash, a little less long. <laughs> <Flash>. <laughs> All right, well, um, so we're at about quarter after six. I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, but man, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. This is you know, one of the first um, opportunities I've had to, to um, participate in one of these formats and also um, you know, a really great opportunity to, to get to know you a little bit better, Matt. Um, I hope that for the, the students in the room and the potential students in the room that this was, um, 
useful or engaging or you know helped you um uh you know just spend some time um yeah and uh yeah we plan on doing these uh quite regularly um at least weekly um i feel like personally we've just scratched the, scratched the surface with uh with matt so i'll be um I'll be uh, knocking on your door to see if you want to come back and chat. Um, yeah, there's, there's. Uh, I feel like our, um, we've got a lot in common, so I, I think we could have some um, more compelling conversations as well. Well, you know, my, my beer is empty, so next time hopefully we can do this with, you know, non-virtual beers. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, so I think that's all for now. Uh, again, you know, keep keep in touch with our uh, our Facebook page. Uh, if you have subscribed already, you'll you'll probably be getting um, notifications for other talks that we'll have. Um, but yeah, I think the best place to find uh, talks if you're if you're not on our mailing list would be our our um, vfs.com page, and definitely uh, um, search out Matt Toner on LinkedIn. Uh, Biba Ventures is um, the amazing initiative that uh, that he's spearheading these days. So um, I would highly recommend that you all check that out as well. Yeah, and if people have questions after this talk, Chris, they can just hit me up on LinkedIn and just say, hey, I was in the audience. Oh, question. Happy to answer. Not a problem. Fantastic. So it's Matt Toner. Uh, hopefully you guys can see the spelling, M-A-T-T, -T, uh, Toner, T-O-N-E-R on LinkedIn. Uh, so that said, thanks again, Matt. Um, I, I really honestly look forward to uh, continuing conversations with you. Uh, good stuff. Okay, folks. Thanks again. Cheers.